We're honored to be part of the Global Earth Repair Summit, which is initiated by one of our key advisory council members, uh, Michael Polarski. And it's great that so many practitioners on earth repair, ecosystem restoration, and regenerative agriculture are convened in this uh, global summit. My name is Peter van der Gaag, and I'm a director of the Ecosystem Restoration Foundation. Our survival on this planet depends on repairing the soil to reduce soil compaction and increase water holding capacity. Restoring ecosystems will change hydrological cycles. The process to get there needs us to understand how to start that restoration in dry circumstances, but vitally for the people living there, also how to produce food with drought resistant crops in those water scarce areas. So in this symposium, we've been able to collect some of the world's uh, leading experts uh, on drought stricken areas and share inspiring on the ground examples from some of the camps where the use of drought resistant plants is helping to restore the natural water function, to restore the water cycle and increase soil fertility. It's our hope that this symposium can support all that are aiming to restore the earth and the symposium will henceforth be available on YouTube for a long time for people to go and look at. I'd like to uh, go straight into our program and introduce our first speaker, Ramis Ket. Uh, Ramis is a consultant with formal training in mechanical engineering uh, and permaculture-based regenerative whole systems design. I think ultimately the problem of uh, you know land degradation, desertification, uh, ecosystem uh, dysfunction is largely a product of the disruption of the uh, of the hydrological cycle of the water cycle. Um, I, I think if we sort of zoom out into a kind of a bit of a macro view of of the the problem, and we look at this as a historical phenomenon. Uh, the, the, the way I often like to discuss this as I like to frame it in, in those terms. So if you look at many of the um, historical surveys that you'll see, what's really interesting about those, those texts and, and others of, of their type is that they look at history through the lens of land use. And that basically a lot of what we see of human history is driven by a progressively uh, worsening um, management of the land that forms the basis of our uh, communities, of our societies, of our civilizations. And, and as you said, it typically starts with uh, the, the, the deforestation um, and the devegetation, the removal of vegetation from, uh, from uh, the landscapes that we have settled. And then along with that, there's a whole set of uh, ecological elements um, the, all of the different uh, uh, fauna, right, in addition to the flora, all the different life forms that are attached to that habitat are, are effectively removed uh, and displaced and undermined. And all of these things are necessary in order to maintain, you know, all of the various systems, the biogeochemical cycles, all the systems that make life possible for us. You know, the, the, the provisioning services, the uh, the regulating services, the supporting services, and even the cultural services. Um, if, if we talk about this in terms of the, the again the ecosystem services, if we use that language. Um, so the, the, one of the the, the um, analogies I like to use is that it's sort of like sort of like removing organs from the body progressively over time, and the more organs that are removed from your body, the the less uh, healthy the body is going to be, the, the less able the body is going to be in its, in its functioning. So there's this, been, this, this progressive um, removal of the, the vital organs that, that provide the basis of the body's functioning, again, over time. And, and I think the, the unfortunate um, kind of reality is that uh, this deconstruction of the body is often, you know, incentivized um, through the advent of uh, not very well thought out policy, uh, through some very problematic ways of thinking about economy and how we, you know, make a living and, and how we support ourselves. And as a consequence, you know, we have this situation that we now call uh, land degradation, desertification, you know, ecosystem dysfunction. And then that, of course, has a, a whole set of um, 
effects that that range from internally displaced peoples, to refugee populations, to you know battles over uh, uh, fighting over resources, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, the 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 more I've been able to travel and see a number of different places um, in various climates, um, you know, various uh, cultures, uh, you you see this same theme play out. So this is very much um, a human problem, uh, and. I think the the part of what we need to do in effectively addressing this problem is, a, a, you know, I think on a again on a on a much more grand scale, we have to be able to rethink the way that we um, see ourselves in the world and the way that we function in it, and and where it is that we see um, like how we are positioned relative to, you know, to other living things right and 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 again the systems that make our lives possible and and i don't think this is a very difficult problem to solve in terms of the the technicalities i think it's the technicalities at this point are pretty clear um if if again we can understand this problem as being primarily driven by uh a disruption of the water cycle which then in turn um uh, becomes a, a major driver of what happens again on on land and then in, in the climate because there is this conversation that takes place between the ground and the atmosphere. Um, you know, you sort of have to work in reverse to to what created the problem in the first place. So if if I go if I go back to um, you know Jared Diamond's uh, account, you know he he sort of has this um, this logical progression of degradation. So, you know, you start with deforestation and habitat destruction, and then that in turn creates um, problems with, with soil. So most notably uh, fertility loss, uh, erosion, and then uh, salinization or, or the salting of soils. And then this in turn uh, sets off uh, problems with water, right? Because the ground becomes too hard, it's no longer uh, and a condition to be able to, to support uh, vegetative life and then all of the, again, the biota and the, and the, and the, and the different uh, uh, fauna um, that make up that habitat that actually maintains it, then you're going to have water problems, right? You're going to have problems with drought, you're going to have problems with flood, and, and, um, and, and that's inevitable. So the, the, the solution is basically um, attempting to to put in a regime to where it allows it, you, you are working backwards, right? You're, you in order to reverse the order. So so you are you are focused on addressing the the water management problem by actually uh, creating a condition to where you're able to put more water in the ground than is um, than is able to again to 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 get away either in the course of uh, evaporating, running off. Typically, those those are the those and those are the two main uh, means of of actually losing water. Is that you have a lot of it that that evaporates. I mean, in, in dry climates, in arid climates, in semi arid climates, um, that's what makes them what they are. That you have far more water leaving uh, in evaporation than you do in precipitation. So, and increasingly, more and more places are are falling into that condition. That that is sort of the underlying um, or major uh, primary description, uh, descriptive characteristic of of those landscapes is that you have a condition to where you no longer have places for that for that water to be sunk in. And again, this is this is largely a product of um, you know the types of uh, again economic systems that we put into place, uh, where they're you know they're largely industrial, um, uh, and even that the, the types of agriculture that we've encouraged, which again are largely industrial. Um, they they don't really uh, they don't model the way that uh, ecologies or ecosystems um, actually function. So again, b just being able to understand this from a you know from a strategic standpoint, um, that if we can't frame this, if we can't frame the 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 solution, 
um, in the right way, then everything that we do uh, is going to be wrong. And I, and I think this is, again, this is largely um, part, of, part of the problem is that the thinking behind the, the solution making or the, or the identifying of solutions, the thinking has, has been um, mistaken. And so, you know, we, we find ourselves investing um, and, and spending a lot of energy doing a lot of the wrong thing. And, and I think, you know, what's, what's, I think what's encouraging is I think we're, we're seeing more and more of the types of things that we've been discussing and the kind of work that many of us have been engaged in. I think we're seeing more and more of that um, make its way into uh, the, you know, the, the, the mainstream discussion of you know what's happening with with uh again quote unquote again climate change or climate weirding weirding or climate uh warming or what whatever whatever language you know folks want to use um i think a lot of this language and a lot of this um a, a lot of what we are uh what we've been discussing and engaged in is, is beginning to make its way into um sort of the the, the mainstream discussion uh, as it concerns this this particular problem I'd love for you to expand a bit more about uh, because you, you in your presentation, you said the traditional way of looking at restoration is you you trace back where it came from and then you take those steps back to full ecosystems. Uh, and then you talked about climate weirding and the fact that the ecosystem has changed and the climate conditions have changed after degradation. Yeah. Uh, how, 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 how do you trace back? I mean, you can't plant the same plants that were there in the beginning. No. No, and, and I'm glad. Actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's that's actually a good point. So, I mean, the fact of the matter is, well, I think for one, there's a, there's an understanding that that ecologies are dynamic. I mean, and effectively, ecologies are sort of um, they're sort of a sort of a, a reflection of 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 energy, really. You know, climate uh, is 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 just an expression of you know again these the atmospheric energies and the and again, these biogeochemical cycles that are affected by a number of different uh, uh, factors. So, you know, climate is largely a product of what's happening on the ground, right? And I think one of the things that I, I know, I think this has, you know, been attributed to, to Alan Savory, but, you know, I know, you know, Masanobu Fukuoka talks about this. I think it was in his book, if I remember correctly, uh, Sowing Seeds in the Desert. And he talked about how, you know, when he came to the American West and he, and he's, and he's looking out at the, at the landscapes, um, that he he had this realization that the that it, it wasn't the the drought that produced the desert, right? It was actually the the desert, the desertification, the removal of vegetation that actually caused the that caused the drought, because because basically the driver of what moves water has been um, has been taken away. You know, Professor Milan Milan talks about this as well. You know, when he says that vegetation is the is the midwife of, of water, um, that the, the the plant right it, it understands sort of intuitively how it needs to be dealt with, and it's actually mediating or um, translating the the conversation in the form of water, like water being the language between the ground and the atmosphere. And so climate change is largely, or climate weirding is largely an expression of the inability for the conversation that, that, that is to happen between the ground and the atmosphere uh, to be mediated by the, by the translator. So the translator has been taken away and, and instead of having a conversation, the ground and the atmosphere is basically screaming at one another, right? And then that's where you have the extremes, right? So not only do you have places that have um, you know, problems of drought. You don't have a pl you don't have a place that has a problem of drought that doesn't also have have a problem with flood, mm -hmm. right? And also, it's going to have a problem with fire. So I'm in I'm in um, the Pacific Northwest. I've been in Seattle for the past. I'm not in San Francisco right now, but um, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm thought I'm, so. <laughs> now I'm a couple hours north, you know, by by plane as the as the crow flies, as the metal crow flies, um, and you know, we just had, we just had fires here. I mean, in fact, um, up to about three days ago, you know, if you look in the papers of what was happening in Seattle, Seattle had the worst air quality in the world. Again, this makes sense given what we know um, has been related to us. And again, many of these historical accounts, 
of the the process of degradation and and again in the mac in, in the in the sort of more comprehensive uh, understanding this is also spelled the con you know the degradation or the destruction or the collapse of civilization is because the things that made civilization possible are no longer able to 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 exist um you know this is in uh, uh james scott's book uh against the grain where he said that you know what made state making possible were what he called the four domestications uh which were uh plants animals uh fire and people and and i would actually include a fifth which he doesn't include in his in his list um i would include the domestication of water um but in the course of that domestication it's also involved the again the destruction or the undermining of um of, of sort of wild um Un, unaffected uh, uh, ecosystems, because ecosystems are simply they're, they're, the ecosystems are just reflecting again the energies of you know of of the atmosphere, or or it's in a con, you're in an active conversation, right? So yet when you look at factors like temperature, um, out you know and how it's affected by albedo, right? How it's affected by evapotranspiration. Um, you have, uh, you know, the, the thermal capacitance or the heat capacitance of all the different forms of thermal mass where you're talking about water, are you talking about stones, are you talking about, again, vegetation? Like you're constantly having this exchange between the ground and the atmosphere. But one of, but the major driver, right, the, the really big one is, is going to be water, right? And, and, and you need vegetation to manage that water in a judicious way, right? So, you know, the, the, and, and again, part of this is a product, and this is a, precisely a, a, a product of everything I've, I've been talking about, that there's a way that many of the landscapes up here have been, have been managed that is re really problematic. And especially with, with, you know, what you were mentioning with the, the species, right? So, the, you know, the, the, the species are not going to be the same as they were in the past because the conditions are different. So I, I, I did a... a consultancy for the Saudis, well, for the Saudi Ministry of um, the Environment, and the, the Saudi uh, Wildlife Authority, where they have a they have a problem with invasive species. They have they have certain species that have kind of taken over certain portions of the kingdom um, that are actually different than the natives. So they've been spending you know a lot of money and doing a lot of things that would be better if they didn't do and trying to remove them. And the question I I, I put forward to them was well instead of spending all of this money in an effort to manage a problem that ultimately you're not actually getting down to the causes of what is creating the problem, you have to ask yourself, well, what are the conditions that have advantaged the invasive species and, have, and that have disadvantaged um, what have been um, historically understood to be the natives? And, and you're seeing the same problem all over the world, right? You're seeing the same issue that the sort of the, um, the the composition of the types of species that you're seeing um, in many places, in most places, um, they're not the same as they were in the past. Why is that? Well, the conditions are different. Yeah. So the, so, so the, the, the ecology is going to express differently because it's just, it's just following what energetically is, is, is possible. I really like the image of, the earth and the atmosphere screaming at each other, but the micro microphone is muted because the plant's not there. 